Well, it's the end of the week. Another week is coming to a close. It is Friday, and that can mean only one thing. It is time to drink beer. Oh, wait. No, no, no. Hold on. It can only mean two things. Number one, <laughs> it's time to drink beer. But number two, it is time for the Dirt to Dust mailbag presented by Outlaw Offroad. We are back again for the episode on Fridays where we answer you, you the people, your questions, your questions, comments, and concerns. We scour the interwebs. We scour the Facebook groups. God bless them. And we find the dumbest question. I mean, the regular question. I mean, just regular, just questions. We just find all, all the questions. Smack myself on the hand. All the questions. <laughs> Gotta calm so, down. So, uh, just because you mentioned it now, uh, since I'm not really a beer drinker, and, and it's almost time for beer drinking, uh, I've got a recommendation for you. I know you're a you're a whiskey bourbon guy. Um, with your recent well, trip to Mexico, somewhere, so hit I me was, with it. With your recent trip to Mexico, I was hoping maybe you uh, are becoming more of a tequila guy okay I, I actually do have a story for that so let's um let's save that for the episode because i really have a really good story for some tequila and a recommendation for people that go to certain certain places in mexico so without further ado let's get this going the friday mailbag when other people see dirt you see glory and when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, so off we go. Let's get going here on the Friday Mailbag. And to go back to the the intro there, yes, uh, tequila. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't dislike tequila. I just think that a lot of the stuff that's sold here in the U.S. is uh, crap. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's full it's of sugar. It's not good. Um, it's but something absolutely that I have, full of sugar. Something I've discovered is um, a Nejo old, uh, like tequila. It's barrel-aged tequila. Uh, it's dark. It's got a bourbon-esque taste to it. Um, without the sugar, without anything, it's still the raw processing. Uh, that, um, with a little bit of lime juice, and I'm telling you, pretty phenomenal so what i did not know is añejo just means it's an age like it's five years in the barrel yeah Mm -hmm. yeah it's aged five years because what i found out is they've they have learned that over five years um certain molds will grow in the barrel and it just makes the so you can't get like a if you get like a nine or ten year tequila um they're lying or it's full of mold (laughs) right just right so it's like it's it's, one is like it's not aged as long as bourbon well there's like reposado is like the crap one Mm -hmm. Then there's an mm-hmm. añejo, which is three years, and then there's extra añejo, which is five years, um, and then reposado, which is only like one year, and then there's the basic one, which is basically clear. Um, so yes, so one of the stops that we went to in Mexico was Cozumel, and tequila is only made. I didn't, I did not know this. Tequila, by the Mexican government standards, is only allowed to be made in Jalisco State, um, which is over on the Pacific side. It's over on the Baja side. Um, so we were in Cozumel, so tequila is not allowed to be made there. So it's not like you can go to, if you go to Cancun or you go to Cozumel or you go to Punta Gorda or you go to any of these, you know, Costa, Costa Maya, um, any of these places and they say, oh, tequila tasting. The tequila is not made there. It's made over in Jalisco and then it's trucked over the, um, over the mountains of Sierra Madres, I think. And it's brought in and they put it on a little boat and they bring it out to Cozumel. So one of the tours that we took was going out to this little family farm. And it's just this little family place that this tequila family owns and they do the tastings. And what I didn't realize is that the tequila that's there, you it doesn't come to the U.S. It's only there that you can buy it. Um, they don't even sell it at the farm in Yalisco. They sell it right there. That's the only place they sell it. And they go through this whole thing of how they make it versus what the standard is in the U.S. because it only has to be, there's like 20-something different kinds of agave plants and the blue agave is the best and that's the one you want. But the stuff that the, the standards in Mexico, it only has to be like 51% blue agave to call it blue agave. They can fill the rest with sugar water or whatever the heck they want to. Um, 
but this was like pure and like they were like we'll just taste it and i'm like yeah okay whatever i've heard the tasting thing before right and we tasted all of their stuff um holy crap it was good. different um mm. oh good is not it 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 was up there with some of the better bourbons that i've tasted it's just a different flavor but it was absolutely awesome you can actually go i changed i, I took a picture one of the guys took a picture of me when I was there. It's actually my Facebook profile picture now is me <laughs> in front of this barrel. Because it's out in the middle of the freaking jungle. There's no refrigerators, dude. They're like trucking in coolers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. you're in these plastic lawn chairs in the middle of the <laughs> island in Cozumel, Mexico, <laughs> trying tequila. And you're like, dude, this seems dangerous. Best tequila. I mean, and it's the second place is not even close. Oh, yeah. Best tequila I've ever had. I ended up bringing home two bottles and the stuff is nice. It's expensive stuff. But when you taste it, it, you see it, and you know what it is, 100% worth it. Absolutely yeah, worth absolutely. it. So it's well, like then Casa with something, the, whatever. Yeah. With, uh, but you can't get with, it here. With real tequila and, and true tequila, I mean, you don't get a hangover either, which is pretty cool. But right. my, my, my weekend recommendation to you is to try Hornitos Black Label Anejo Tequila uh, with a little bit of Coke Zero in line. You're going to put that up against the tequila I just told you about and expect me to come uh, back and say um, it's good? I, I, it would hold the candle to okay. the flame. All right. Okay. That's well, all next. <laughs> so follow up to this episode because I didn't know this was coming. I will bring. I will bring a bottle of the stuff I got in. Um, I got in Mexico because if you ever go to anybody that's watching, if you ever go to Cozumel, you can go to this place. Um, and the same place that owns this little tour company was part of the family that owns that farm. They own this little tour company because it's part of their their shtick is to get you to this tequila farm. And then they get you to this um, beach club, Chula's Beach Club, Chula's something, Chula's. Um, that's not the name of the tequila. But that's kind of the whole thing is they take you around the island. They drive you around. They get you this private tour. We rode around in a lifted JK all day. And we were with our, you know, our, our guide, Aaron, who was questionable at first. Aaron did have a spider tattoo right here. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we are about to get kidnapped by drug cartels. <laughs> Younger dude, like his flat bill basketball hat from the U.S. And I'm like, I think I've seen this in a movie. <laughs> Turned out to be one of the nicest dudes I have ever freaking met. And awesome. he'd only been doing the job for like a, like a month and a half, but he was just super awesome dude. So not that he's ever going to see this, but shout out to Aaron um, at Chula's <laughs> in Cozumel. You never so. know. If, I mean, the Jeep world travels far. So you just, you yeah, and their whole, their whole tour company was based on riding in Jeeps, riding around the island. They show you the local beaches, all that kind of stuff. So mm. super cool spot. I'll bring the bottle for the next episode. I'll get it up. Awesome. Show people Can't where wait. it is. It was, it's oh, so good. It was so good. Can't so, wait. but that's not well, really, I don't think that was a mailbag really question mailbag other than question. your mailbag. Uh, you do, you yeah, your no, that was a little sidetrack, but that's all right, okay. all right. People like to hear Let's some calm down stuff. here. Hit me with the questions. Uh, I've got a couple short ones. Nothing crazy right. this week. Um, this one for was from a comment on um, actually Outlaw Off Road's YouTube channel on the gear video that we have. Um, that thing is blowing up like crazy. Uh, Rob S K S A S is the username. Uh, he said, I got a sweet deal on a 2012 JK Sahara with a three, six, six speed manual on 35s. I think it has three seventy threes. not positive. Uh, my question is, are five thirteens going to be a little much? The Jeep will see about 60% Montana highway and 40% steep mountains. What tire size do you say was going with 37s? 30. He's got it on 35s. Now it's in a manual. Um, doesn't mention anything about going to a bigger tire size, but one can only assume potentially. And it's an automatic and it's a JK. And it's a, you uh, said it was a 2012, six, right? Six speed manual JK. Yeah. Three, six. Okay. And it's a 2012. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Five thirteen is too deep. Yeah. That's a little too deep. Agree. That's going to be, that's going to be super I torquey. Um, um I, I wouldn't, I would look, <sighs> I mean, unless you're in a hilly area, I mean, I'm going to look which, at 456s for that. Which he, he did say 6% Montana Highway and 40% steep mountain. Oh, yeah. So it, it is in a steep mountainous Dude. area. So I would maybe step up to 40. Yeah, minutes. but Montana's different, but, man. I've been out there. Montana's like miles and miles and miles of flat nothingness. And then you just like see two mountains pop up like, like out of nowhere. Um, I, I definitely would not go 513, 100%. Um, I could maybe, and I mean maybe, see 488 if, along with the lift and the wheels and the tires, you had bumpers on there, you had a big spare, you had a winch, all that kind of stuff. Because of the mountain stuff, I could absolutely see going 488. I could see that. Um, if it was slightly modified and it was just lift wheels, tires, and we didn't do big bumpers and we weren't going, you know, I could then I would see my standard 
for that would be 456. Um, that's kind of where I would go immediately. But if you start talking about heavier modifications, MTs versus ATs, you know, maybe it's got bead locks instead of regular wheels. It's got a big back bumper, got a tire carrier. We start talking about that, then I'm going to go 488. But depending on where he's at in that, and hopefully he's listening, this is the one that you actually told the guy, hey, we're going to answer your question on an episode. Go watch the episode, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I linked this uh, this channel and, and said, hey, we're, we would love to answer this on our other right, channel. Bud. And yeah. <laughs> All right, bud. So if you're watching, <laughs> I'm talking to you. All right, Rob. If, um, if you're lightly, lightly yeah. modified and you don't have a bunch of extra stuff on there, Rob, right, Rob? Um, 456. If you are modified and you've got mud tires versus ATs or you've got bumpers, you've got a winch, you've got all that kind of stuff on there, um, then I'm going to go 488. If you're, I don't know if you said number of doors. If you're a two door, um, just don't even think about 488. Just go 456. Um, but if you're a four door and you're modified, go 488. Don't go 513. You're, you're not, that's too deep. That's going to be way too torquey. You're going to be able to, you're never going to, your first gear is going to be useless. It's going to be so short. It's going to be useless to have it. So take what I said, 456, 488, depending on where you're at in that spectrum. Yeah. I would say if, if the steep mountain climbs are, are truly that much of your commute uh, and you still want to see six gear and maybe only have to drop down to fifth to go up the steep mountain, I would say 488. 488. But mm-hmm. other than that, yeah, there's no need to go to 513 with a 35 inch tall tire. No. No, it's no. too deep. Too deep. Yeah. So like I said, quick and easy on that one. Uh, the next one comes from a um, Facebook group, actually. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce this last name. I know the first name is Dimitri. I love um, the Facebook groups. They're so amazingly <laughs> terrible. Um, the last name's Russian or something of of Eastern European descent. I'm not going to It's probably it. just one of those uh, fake Facebook last names. Like, nobody uses their real last name anymore. Know. Either way. Uh, My name is This one's actually an interesting Dukanda. one. This is a question that we haven't got before, but... Um, for people in the, the northern part of the country, it would be a pretty solid answer. Uh, what do you recommend okay. to use to spray and clean for underbelly, undercarriage, and for rust prevented, prevention? Oh, okay. So back in the day, I've actually had this question down south before, um, mostly because of our proximity and, and certain stores that we have to the beach. And, you know, People that live up north, they it's big to them because of the salt trucks in the winter. The road's getting salted all the time. But down here, especially if you get close to the beach, um, it's just salt air. Like, there's just salt in the air. You're screwed year-round. Um, now, granted, it's not to the levels of what you would see up in, like, Wisconsin or Michigan, a.k.a. South Canada, you know, New York, Maine, that kind of thing. Um, so back in the day, there was companies out there that would actually – you could pay them. And just like now, you could pay to have somebody detail your car – and like ceramic coat it, they would spray undercoat. Now I know up north that's still a thing. I've known that people have done. There are people who spray oily substances under there. I'm not a fan of that because it just collects dirt, dust, all that stuff. Does it protect the metal? Yes, but it's going to create other issues. I like um, Amsoil has a product called Mud Slinger um, that you can put on. Um, it, it makes dirt come off easier. I know there's some companies that have stuff on there that's designed to soak in the metal and make stuff not stick. It's basically ceramic coating for your under, for your underside. I'm also not opposed to using ceramic coat on the bottom side. Um, I'm not a fan of most of those companies that do undercoat have dried up. There's just not a demand for it anymore because most, most manufacturers now are e-coating the bottom and supposedly that's supposed to be better, but I know there are some companies that have issues with that. So I definitely understand that, but you can also just get on Amazon now and buy spray can e-coat um and that's fine i I don't i don't i wouldn't put too much effort into getting in there to undercoat um i think you know get under there with some mud slinger i think that's fine i wouldn't spend a lot of money or a lot of time worrying about this because the stuff these companies are undercoating with now from the factory are far superior to what it used to be where you had to think about that um i really wouldn't even spend the money to, to ceramic coat it unless you're ceramic coating the rest of the vehicle. If you're doing the rest of the vehicle and they're doing the wheels and the, you know, they're doing the steer. Okay, fine. Uh, spend the extra couple hundred and get it done. Cause you're already spending all that money to ceramic coat it. Why not? Um, ceramic coat does work. It, it does work. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely give it that it's better than nothing. I think it's a little overpriced for what it is. Um, but I think over the shelf, I think over the counter stuff, you know, the mudslinger and the products like that side by sides have a lot of that product too. 
Um, that's probably where I would go is look at the side by side products because that that stuff is made to just not let mud stick. Right? It's not a rust inhibitor or anything like that. It's just made to not let stuff stick. So I think I would just yeah. go with one of the over counter products, like a mud slinger type product. Yeah. And, and for, call it for a day. strictly for strictly cleaning, absolutely. For a little bit of rust preventative, I've used fluid film in the past. Um with good results, like you said, it does attract some mud. If you're not going to wheel heavily or anything like that, fluid film works really well. It's a good coating. It lasts for a while. Um, but as Doug said, it will make things stick a little more, and you do have to clean it more often. And then, therefore, you have to use the product more often. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. But for strictly just cleaning the underside, um, yeah, any kind of mudslinger product or anything like that, um, definitely a pressure washer. Well. I tried yeah. the one of those times, I tried that little like sprinkler looking thing on wheels. I tried that. Here's the problem. They're not made for lifted vehicles. No, they're not. They don't so they've got it. these things that are on like these little sprinkler wheels, and you're supposed to be able to hook a hose to it, and you just kind of move it back and forth, and it's got these jets that just point up, and it's supposed to work. I'm sure there's a product out there that's made for lifted vehicles, but the ones that I have tried, I've tried a few of them, they're, they're made to get under cars, and the problem is by the time the water hits the underside of a lifted truck or a Jeep or something like that, the water pressure's gone. Like it's so much of a pressure drop. So if there's, I would be highly interested if there's one out there that's made for lifted vehicles, somebody please drop a link to that because I would be interested in that because the only other option is we just, we just did this to a customer's vehicle earlier this week. You know, you got to take it up to a car, but you got to get under that thing with a pressure washer and you're getting dirty and it's getting dirty and you're slinging crap everywhere. So maybe, maybe the fans and the listeners can help out on that one. I haven't seen one that gets it, that maintains pressure up you know, that 14, 15, 16, 17 inches that it would need to, but mm -hmm. maybe there is one out there. So please, somebody let me know if I'm missing yeah. on that. Or um, I will there may it. be a certain chain of car washes in your area. I know the one that's almost right across the street from me. Yeah. They actually have a Jeep on the logo of the car wash business. Um, nice. I can go through and I can do an undercarriage only wash. Um, I think their tracks are good for 37, up to 37 inch tall tires or like a 1350 wide tire. Um, but I can roll through and they'll turn every brush off and then only spray and soap the undercarriage and then rinse it. And then I just pull out of there. So, uh, well, that's what that's the world like, needs more like, of right there. It's like seven bucks. It's, it's really not bad. Forget uh, world peace. It's never going to happen. People. <laughs> let's get more, let's get more off-road undercarriage car washes. Cause that's what we really need these days. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I think that's right, awesome. And, uh, last but not least, um, this one is from, um, this one's actually on the Dirt to Dust channel, which is awesome. Please keep those comments coming. Um, from Mr. Rick Lime, 1793 is the username. Uh, I really appreciate and enjoy the channel. I have a 22 Jeep Wrangler Rubicon, and I have an entry-level 3-inch lift, but I'm looking for significantly more flex. Could you make a suggestion for suspension for someone who wants to take the Jeep to the next level and beyond? Yeah, I mean, we talked about this before. When, you know, he said it's an entry level three inch kit. So entry level, I'm going to assume is spring shocks, sway bar links. Like that's entry level, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe a front track bar and a rear track bar bracket, maybe. Um, and if you want flex, it's actually very, very simple. Uh, finish the kit. We've talked about this countless times about the difference between kits is the quantity and quality of the parts. So we're not talking about quality here. We're simply talking about quantity. Um, more parts. So. Make sure if you don't already, make sure you get an adjustable front and rear track bar. That's going to help a little bit. Get control arms. Get aftermarket control arms with like like with, like with Rock Crawler. They have the flex joints. With Metal Cloak has there. Get a joint that's designed to have some misalignment in there. Call these manufacturers. Ask them what their misalignment number is. Ask them, is it 45 degrees? Is it 60 degrees? What are your misalignment numbers? If it's 30, don't buy it. Uh, but, yeah. Rock, Rock you know, Crawler actually posts arms. those numbers publicly on their website, too. Yeah, and most people will. If they won't tell you, eh, I'm questioning it a little bit. But, you know, Curry uses Johnny joints. Totally fine. The the joint that um I think Clayton's still using a Johnny joint. Totally fine. Rock Crawler's Adventure X. Rock Crawler's X Factor. Um. Those are all great, great joints to get flex out of, and you're going to get the side benefit of actually being able to dial in your alignment and your alignment geometry with track width, with caster, with you know thrust angle, all that stuff you're going to be able to dial in. So there's zero negative to being able to, to do in that kind of stuff, but the additional of you know having a arm that is built to be comfortable at droop, to be comfortable at flex with one side of the axle up and one side of the axle down um, which the factory stuff is just not. Um, 
and then making sure that you're properly paired with shocks and coils. If you've got a three inch lift, but your shock's only going to droop to 27 inches extended, you're probably going to need a longer shock. Like you may have a conservatively built shock and you're going to be limited. You're going to be limited because generally on general off-road rigs, your shock down, your shock extended length is it's the number one. If everything else is done right, your shock is going to be the limiter of down travel because you're not running 99% of weekend wheelers out there aren't running limit straps. So you're either going to bind your control arm, but now we're talking about fixing that. Or now if you, you know, if you're disconnected and you've got everything else set up, right, your shock extended length is going to be your down travel limiter uh, and your up travel limiter, depending on, you know, if you've got a 10 inch, 10 and a half inch travel shock versus a 12, 12 and a half inch travel shock, that's a big difference. And I'm going to tell you because of motion ratios, one inch in travel on a shock makes a big difference. You're going to see that because that shock is mounted several inches inboard of the outside of the tire. So if you think about it like a circle, if I'm only moving one inch there, depending on the motion ratio, I'm moving several inches here. So if your motion ratio is 1.5 to one for every one inch you're moving here, you're moving one and a half inches out here uh, or two inches is three, three inches is four and a half. That's a big difference. So, you know, keeping motion ratios in mind, you know, for every inch of total flex or total travel that you can gain, you're ex you're you're multiplying that based on the motion ratio. And the longer, the bigger the offset of the tires are, the bigger the tires are, that motion ratio is going to go. So just because the factory might be 1.5 to one, by the time you put negative 38s on bead locks and 37, your motion ratio is increasing because you've pushed out on that circle. You've pushed out the di- that cir- that radius of that circle, so to speak. And your motion ratio increases. So everything you can do um, is going to increase that flex. Um, so control arms and then just, again, making sure everything else is right. Track bars, shock length, all that good stuff. And then control arms to allow that flex because you can have the shock and coil set up right. But if you put your bind, if you put your control arm in a bind where you're the, the, the cage of your control arm joint is maxing out and hitting the mount, those flanges, it's going to stop drooping anyway. So... Suspension really needs to be taken as a total. You need to look at everything and don't be afraid to go get on a flex ramp or something, drive it up on the flex ramp and start looking at everything, get it up on a sidewall, get it up on that metal cloak RTI trailer, get it up somewhere, get it up on a lift at a shop, get it up on a forklift, lift those wheels and look for interference and say, okay, well, I'm limited here. I'm limited here. Let me go change that. That's all metal cloak does. That's what this, that was the original point of the, RT the CTI they call it CTI that was the point of the CTI trailer was that Corey would get that thing up and for you guys know Corey's the guy that runs the metal coat trailer good guy he would get those up and he would start and he still does this and he's a master at it he goes around corner to corner and will show you hey here's where you're binding up here's where you're limiting your travel here's where this is not right here's what you can do to make it do better so you know it's a it's a there is no easy answer unfortunately other than just buy more parts <laughs> And that's a good start, but once you do that, you really—if you really want to maximize articulation—I don't—I don't like using the word flex, but if you really want to maximize articulation, you know, it's kind of fun. I enjoy that. That's fun to me. Mm-hmm. Of replace the part, get in there and find find those little tweaks. Just fine tuning is—I is cool. love it. That's that yeah. is man. That's, I love doing that kind of stuff. I think that's what takes you from like a general like. I like this to like an actual enthusiast is when you're I able to so. start fine tuning and you're paying yep. attention to the details. Uh-huh. The only thing I would add to that, um, once you do all of those things, sometimes the factory Rubicon sway bar and end links are the limiting factor. Yes. Uh, I would look at rock crawlers, no limits sway bar. No, uh, because it's also got some high misalignment joints mm-hmm. on it, mm-hmm. uh, and they're just more heavy duty. They're aluminum. They're anodized. They looked really cool. So, uh, I would look into those in addition to what Doug said. Um, and then with all those things, you should be seeing quite a bit more travel. Um, and like, and also like Doug said, definitely get it on a flex ramp or a CTI trailer. Uh, I know Corey does bring that around the country to several different events. Oh, throughout everywhere. The year. Yeah. Um, if you've got a local shop with a with a with a ramp or if you've got like a sidewall or you know like forklift or anything like that you there's so many ways to test that out i so, got through the lj right. on a forklift a couple weeks ago and and checked out some clearances on and realized we need to move lower coil difference. over mounts so yep. that's uh that's what happened to mine this weekend so i want the same thing i want a little bit more <laughs> just a little bit more well and i'll tell you too a little free tech tip I, you know most of people a lot of people are buying disconnecting sway bars or just disconnecting it but 
when looking at rear sway bar links and fronts, if you're like in a Mojave Gladiator, you're in a Rubicon where you just hit the button and you don't actually disconnect, making sure that you're setting them up properly when they're connected. Um, you know, at the factory, generally sway bars are set up parallel to the ground. But when you're lifted and you want that articulation, we don't do that. We look for a roughly 10 degrees of up above parallel in lifted vehicles because it's just going to give you that little bit more of down travel, especially in the rear. You don't want your sway bar links. You don't want them to be their limiting factor on going down. You want up travel and down travel. You know, we don't just want to talk about down travel. So you want them long enough to where they're going to allow that, but you don't want them so jacked up that they that 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 joint becomes like this and then rolls under and you flip the sway bar because I've seen that before. So you definitely don't want to do that. It's it's again, we could get into that. We dude, I could do like an entire series on setting up geometry for a lift. But for this guy, I would definitely start with some more parts, making sure that kit has it, add some control arms, and then go have fun with, like, get into it, man. Like, I don't know if not everybody's like that. Like, I geek out on that kind of stuff. I freaking yeah. love suspension geometry. I'm oh, about to I start do doing it on the 4 by e probably tomorrow to say, get it dialed in for Moab. Yeah, I would just say take it. You're going to take it from an entry-level 3-inch to a, a, a pretty moderate, um, you know, 3.5 more than likely. Mm-hmm. And I would say, even if budget's a concern, start with front lowers and rear uppers. Mm-hmm. See if that gets you what you want, and then add the front uppers and the rear lowers if you want right. more. Uh, yeah. That's where I would start. I mean, articulation's Absolutely. not going to give you much by just doing front lowers. So do front lowers and rear uppers. That's going to give you a little bit, and then make sure everything else is mm-hmm. dialed in. See what you think, and then you can always add more um, as as your time permits, as your budget permits, your desire, whatever. That's yeah, where I'm at absolutely. on that. That's it. Doug, that's all the questions I have for you today. That's why I threw in the tequila question. That was all for the tequila episode. I mean, mailbag. <laughs> that's it for the tequila. Look, I'll episode, bring that. Guys. I'll bring the bottle. I'll bring the bottle. We're going to talk about it yeah. on the next episode. We'll, I just got to remember we'll to bring it a little bit. I've got we'll bottles of bourbon on my bar. I've got bourbon yeah. covered. I don't have the tequila here, so I'll take care yeah. of that. I apologize. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll no, do a little trading. I'm heading out to uh, right. to Denver this weekend, so we'll see what b- bottles of whatever I can collect. I'm doing a little bachelor party type deal. Um, just meet a couple of buddies going out to Denver and hanging out for a little bit. But I think I'm supposed to I can bring Virginia something back. I'll bring something back. Family. We're going to go up to the woods. Nice. Ooh. Well, but you, okay. So Hornitos Extra Añejo or Black Label, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to do yeah, some research first, see where it's grown, see the, if, it, if it meets the standards, then yes. But that is the problem with the U.S. tequila. It's pretty much most of it's, it's not like, sugar water. It, it is. And that's and that's unfortunate. But it idiots is. at the college bars drink it. So if they're gonna they can sell it. <laughs> Welcome to capitalism, baby. We'll sell it. Yep. All right. Uh well, that is all we got for this week. Another episode of Mailbag in the vault. Appreciate you guys hanging out with us, watching, listening, and an extra little shout out to those who submitted the questions in the comments. So we actually had content for this episode. Absolutely. Uh if it's first time, thanks for stopping by. Hope you do it. Hope you do it more often. Uh, don't forget, click like, click subscribe. Do the comments, ask the questions, do all of that stuff uh, wherever you're finding us. YouTube, YouTube podcast, uh, Spotify, Apple, wherever, whatever, whenever, um, no matter what, we thank you guys for stopping by. That is going to do it for us for this week's episode of Dirt to Dust Mailbag. Don't forget to stop by next Wednesday and every Wednesday when we drop another episode. Who knows what it's going to be? You're just going to have to come in, stop by and check it out to find out with the rest of us. Until then. Caleb, have a great weekend. You're going one way. I'm going the other. I think we're both <laughs> yeah. ended up going to be up, up in the mountain some way this weekend. Some uh, way, some we'll talk. We'll talk tequila more next weekend or next week. Next weekend. <laughs> Man, I've already got some tequila in me. Woo. What is it? Tequila Tuesday. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a great weekend. Until next time, right. we'll see you guys in the next episode. You've been listening to the Dirt to Dust. Presented by Outlaw Off-Road. The premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time don't follow us you're not gonna make it